I'm Charles Rush. Uh, I'm your host uh, today, if you will. I'm the Regional Agricultural Attaché at Biosynthesis in Rome. Uh, but before I go any further, I would like to recognize Italy's Undersecretary for Agriculture, Food, and Forestry Policies, Senator Francesco Bastioni, uh, if you're here with us uh, this afternoon and uh, this morning, um, to continue. Um, I'm excited to be here with you this afternoon and with uh, uh, admittedly a very esteemed group of scientists uh, from the United States, Italy, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Ghana, Croatia, Greece, Nigeria, and Serbia. Wow, uh, this is exciting, uh, highly technical. I'd like to thank my staff and our colleagues in the public affairs section who are taking excellent care of us through this uh, technology known as Zoom uh, for today's event. So um, before I move this over to the experts, uh, as many of you in the room spend a great deal of time trying to improve agriculture, either developing new procedures, products as a researcher, helping to get them to market in the private sector, or actually growing crops or raising them. Just to let you know that we appreciate your efforts. We look forward to your presentation and uh, we do look forward to some robust uh, questions and discussions. And uh, now we go to Serbia and my colleague from Belgrade will introduce the speakers. Tanya. Good afternoon from Belgrade. Uh, it is my honor to introduce uh, a short clip uh, prepared for this afternoon for from Dr. Alexei Tarasiev from the Institute for Biological Research. He will give us just a short introduction about the Serbian policy on biotechnology and the new breeding technology. After that, we will have a presentation from Dr. Uro Savkovic, research associate from the Institute for Biological Research, University of Belgrade. So I would like to ask now uh, Marco, Steven, I'm not sure who will launch the video of Dr. Tarasiev. Thank you. Hi from Belgrade, Serbia, from Institute for Biological Research, Sinisha Stankovic, University of Belgrade. I am Alexei Tarasiev head of Department for Evolutionary Biology and chair of Serbian Expert Council on Biosafety. I want to thank organizers uh, for inviting us to participate in this very e interesting and useful event. I want also to apologize for not being able to participate in questions and answers session because at the time of this workshop, I will be participating in UNEP Jeff Biosafety Clearing House meeting in Dubai. I would like to emphasize several points on the relationship between topic of this webinar and current situation with biotechnology and biosafety in Serbia. We still have uh, both unsafe and very re restrictive GMO law. Uh, cultivation and placing on a market are prohibited and only experimental use in laboratories and field trials can be approved. It is uh, understandable that when uh, with no prospect of uh, commercialization, research in this area is also hampered. Regarding new breeding techniques, decision of European Court of Justice on new mutagenesis techniques is relevant for Serbia. Serbia is not EU member state, uh, so uh, this decision is not mandatory, but since we are candidate ca country, uh, it is highly likely that those techniques uh, will fall under GMO regulation in Serbia too. On the other side, Serbia is a party to the Convention on Biological Diversity 
and on Cartagena protocol on biosafety. Uh, definition under, of biotechnology under the convention is much wider than its definition under Cartagena Protocol. And Serbia is taking an active role in covering that wider area, for example, by participating in ad hoc technical expert group on synthetic biology. Synthetic biology covers not only GMOs, new breeding and new mutagenesis techniques, but also other very interesting uh, technological applications of biology, such as nucleic acid-based circuits, uh, genome-level engineering, directed evolution, gene drives, to mention just a few. Uh, all those techniques offer important tools for practical solutions in agriculture, pest control, mitigation of climate change, and in many other fields. And Serbian scientists are making their contributions to them. I have a pleasure to introduce my colleague from Department for Evolutionary Biology, Uroš Savković, who is leading ongoing project Elevate, Experimental Evolution Approach in Developing Insect Pest Control Methods, supported by, by Republic of Serbia Science Fund. That research clearly demonstrates how concepts and approaches from basic science, which is main focus of research in our institute, can lead to the state-of-the-art solutions to practical problems in agriculture and environmental impact mitigation. Urosh, floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for this opportunity to discuss briefly about the project that I'm uh, participating and leading. Uh, so, as uh, said, uh, in the previous uh, introduction from Dr. Alexi Tarasiev, um, my project focuses on how we can use experimental evolution in order to develop new methods for pest insect control. Nowadays, we know that um, there is a huge demand for insecticides that are commonly used in uh, treating insects worldwide. However, these uh, pesticides or insecticides are having temporary effects, so they have to be repeated each and every time, often several times during the season. Also, they are very harmful to the environment, human health, but also to the biodiversity because they cause damage to non-target species. Also, insects are able to evolve resistance to the insecticides relatively quickly. And this is an example of how fast evolution can be under strong selective pressures. Furthermore, Best insects are able to switch to a new plant host and cause even greater damages to the yields that uh, are important for human food. This in turn causes even greater damage and we need to find novel and effective ways of how to treat uh, these things and how to improve our pest management strategies. I strongly believe that experimental evolution is a promising method in modernizing agriculture. So the experimental evolution uh, is a powerful approach that monitors changes in real time. It, causes, it can track changes on phenotypic, but as well at genomic levels. And we know now, and we've heard from brilliant talks today, how genomics uh, is really important in developing new tools in agriculture. Uh, 
So to give you just a glimpse of what experimental evolution is, it is basically putting a model organism, in this case, a seed beetle, an insect, that I will talk about in a few minutes, uh, putting it in a context, putting it in a situation and letting it evolve. In our laboratory, we have populations that are selected for high or low population densities for different plant hosts, for ability to uh, deal with uh, various concentrations of insecticide, or for example, uh, reducing or changing the time when the reproduction is allowed. I will focus my attention briefly onto this last part of age of reproduction in order to uh, emphasize how changes in a context where beetles are reared can have dramatic effects on their life cycles. So from the theory, we know that the selection, the force of selection is highest prior to the start of reproduction. When the reproduction starts, we see the losing ability of uh, force of selection and the mortality rates are increased. By manipulating the start of reproduction going either fewer days or longer days, we were able to produce early or late selection lines uh, that have dramatic differences in their um, uh, survivorship uh, or mean lifespans. So originating from this base population, both females and males were able, uh, were able to evolve very different regimes and uh, early reproducing lines started to live short and late reproducing lines were living as double as the amount of these E lines. So this is just to, an example of how this uh, experimental evolution method can actually change life history traits in a seed beetle. So why the seed beetle? Why this model system? So this is a pest species known worldwide uh, and it can cause as much as 40% of damage into annual yields. So this means that storages can be very affected by this pest insect. It is a holometabolic insect and it, it can be found in storages worldwide. But this is a brilliant model system for experimental evolution because it can uh, actually, the uh, conditions in the laboratory often resemble conditions that we can found, find in storages. Because of that and its commercial importance, our research has three main avenues in the Elevate project that uh, was mentioned at the beginning. So the first one, the first avenue is to uh, know the mechanisms of uh, insecticide resistance. Then we want to know what is the potential uh, and what lays behind that potential to switch between the hosts and to be able to uh, change and make even greater damage. And finally, in different, uh, uh, in, in, in different avenue of the research is our development of a completely novel uh, technique called Trojan female technique uh, that was not observed uh, before in a pest species, and we are trying to develop it uh, even more. So my talk today will focus mostly on this third part of the development of the Trojan female technique. So because the Trojan female technique relies on naturally occurring mutations located in mitochondria uh, that are having sex-specific effects and are male hampering, uh, I will talk about a little bit about mitochondria. So we all know that mitochondria are uh, having their own genome, 
which encodes 13 proteins. 1,500 1, proteins are coded for, from nucleus. So in order to cooperate and function well, the two genomes need to be very synchronized in their effect. Why is that? Because mitochondria are the most important, their most important role is the generation of uh, energy from the ATP synthetase. So in this slide here, you see a complex called oxidative phosphorylation process, which is located at the mitochondrial inner membrane. And this complex uh, is made of five multi-subunit uh, enzyme complexes. And four of them are a mix between the parts of it encoded by the mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA. Only complex two is coded uh, completely from the nuclear genome. And therefore, in order to eukaryotic cell, which all have mitochondria, to work and function well, they need to be in a close cooperation two genomes that need to cooperate. Additional and different uh, biological feature of mitochondria is that they are strictly maternally inherited. This brings us to the evolutionary concept that is called mother's curse hypothesis. So what mother's curse hypothesis basically states is that mitochondria from sperm, from a uh, male parent, will not go into next generation with only few examples in the living world. So all the uh, mitochondria are inherited through maternal line. This brings us uh, to uh, uh, an evolutionary uh, dead alley because uh, selection is completely blind for any mutation that is harmful to males, but it does not have any neutral or beneficial effects on females. So in this slide, you can see that selective sieve will just drop, uh, uh, it will continue to produce uh, mutations even if they are harming males. So this mother's curse hypothesis is the basis of our Trojan female technique. Why Trojan females? So if in a population you have mutations in the mitochondrial genome that are uh, harming males, but are having no negative effects on females, these mutations can be uh, can linger on in a population that they can be maintained in a population. Um, so these, um, if having this, uh, the the female with a mutation is called uh, a Trojan female, and uh, their offspring is called. Uh, if they are females, they're called Trojan daughters. And if they are males, they're called Trojan sons. In theory, by having a Trojan candidate mutation, it can be uh, passed on generation from generation that will produce males that are subfertile. And why are males subfertile? Because their mitochondria are not very synchronized with the nuclear genome that we discussed before uh, on the previous slide. So in our work, uh, we've started from this by uh, doing uh, mitochondrial DNA uh, genome analysis and identifying uh, six different haplotypes uh, called mitotypes because they're uh, done on a mitochondrial DNA. Uh, so these uh, have all been identified as amino acid changes, and here are their, their names. Uh, also, they are uh, 
quite remarkably dis distanted, some of them are clustered, as you can see in this mighty locust genotype network, but some, as you can see, are quite far away. So the first thing that we needed to do is to actually identify differences in their genomes. Then what we needed to do is think about what will be the experimental design in order to test these candidate TFT mutations. So how did we did do that? So first of all, we uh, took an example of um, having a Trojan female, a female that brings the mutation with a specific effect on fertility. By crossing these females with males that are not having any negative mutations, we in the F1 generation obtained offspring of males and females with the mitochondria that are having sex-specific uh, effects. These cursed sons, when uh, bred with wild type females, are having limited, should have limited uh, offspring or even no offspring at all compared to Trojan daughters, where uh, when they are bred with wild type uh, males, are continuing um, to produce a mutation specific uh, mitochondria in both daughters and sons. So we did exactly this and we managed to get some results. So out of those haplotypes that you've observed, we were able to identify that cursed sons in a specific variance called, for example, MG3B have dropped 40% of reproductive output compared to their Trojan daughters. So we see a dramatic shift in some of those variants. Some of them, as you can see here, are not being affected at all. So they are not a good candidate TFT mutations, but some are. I would like to stress this, these mutations are quite rare in nature. So it was a challenge even to find them, but when we did find them and compared with other life history traits, such as fertility or early fecundity of these seed beetles, we've managed to see a huge difference between Trojan daughters and cursed sons. Um, this allowed us uh, to design and um, to select these uh, particular mutations and uh, to test them even further. And this will be the part of the project Elevate that I am uh, currently uh, leading. So uh, in, in this project, what we really want to do is actually uh, test the suppression of male fertility in a range of genetic uh, um, environments because these candidate mutations need to be effective across a range of nuclear backgrounds, but they also have to be uh, effective uh, in, a, in a range of uh, environmental contexts. For this, we will use three temperatures and simulate changes that can be seen in real life scenarios. And uh, to conclude, uh, we need to see how effective are these mutations in a populations to be more precise, we need to find what is the suitable frequency of these females brought into a population in order to have the effect that we want. And that is transgenerational suppr uh, um, suppression of a past population. I would like to especially thank my uh, team of great working uh, team of, of the Institute for Biological Research, Faculty of Biology, Faculty of Medicine, and Faculty of Sciences from University of Kragujevac. And also I would like to thank the organizers for making this uh, available and for introducing me to, 
give this uh, special talk. Uh, by having said that, I am open to uh, your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Savkovic. This was very interesting.